When we get there, again, we're going back to the continuity conditions. The continuity conditions. But now, notice that we have the potential being discontinuous at two points. x equals to 0 and x equals to 8. So we can apply the continuity equations even though the potential is discontinuous at that point at those points. Which is x equals to 0 and x equals to 8. So what can I say when x equals to 0? When x is equal to 0, the wave function psi 1 and psi 2 are going to be equal. Alright, because psi 1 and psi 2 covers the solutions in these two regions. And so they are first derivative in terms of x. At psi a, the continuous conditions apply to these two solutions over here, which is psi 2 and psi 3, given by that over there, as well as their derivatives being equal. And I will apply those continuity conditions. I want to stress again that when we apply the continuity conditions, we are always applying them to these things called psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3, and not the, the solutions, the separate linear combinations of the solutions. It's always this psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3. The separate uh, solutions, the linear combinations of the separate solutions will go inside the transmission coefficient. But the continuity conditions are always applied to psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3. So, as an exercise, maybe we can try to do that. Now, I'm not going to rearrange the terms because it takes way too long. But the first one, always substitute 0 inside here. We will get A plus B is equal to C plus D. Alright, and the second one, basically I just want to bring down the IK1 because when I take the derivative of this psi1, I will differentiate the, the transcendental number, so I will bring the argument down by excluding the x. So I'll get A minus B is equals to um, IK2, okay, IK2 because of psi2, and I'll get uh, C take away D. Alright, so this is the continuity conditions, or what the continuity conditions tells us when we apply the x equals to 0. Now, when x equals to 8, things will get a little bit more messy because notice when x is equal to 8, the transcendental numbers do not equal to 1. Okay, that, that may be a problem for us. So, what I'll get is that I'll get CE, now I'll get IK2A plus E, uh, wait, yeah, plus E, uh, sorry, C, yeah, plus E, min, uh, E minus IK2A, and it's equal to substitute A inside there, I'll get E, capital E, transcendental number E. I k 1 a just substitute a where x is and then later when I differentiate that it's really a bit of the same thing but now I would need to put a i k 2 um, as a constant for for the first one because really I differentiate I bring down the argument but really I think the argument is going to be the same because if you substitute a inside the argument will be the same so this I would get um, e c e i k 2 a but a minus sign because of the minus sign over there d e minus ik2a and this is equals to ik1e transcendent number e ik1a and these are the continuity conditions that we have now notice that everything kind of draws boils down very nicely because we got five unknowns here in terms of a b c d uh, a b c d e but we got the continuity conditions we got four okay which is that as, as expected because now i can express a b c d in terms oh sorry b c d e in terms of a all right, and maybe that is what I want to do. Now, as you can see from those equations, there is really a humongous task going through probably every single technique in college algebra to express E in terms of A. Why do I want to do that? Because we want to calculate the transmission coefficient, but it's really a difficult task because we've got all these messy transcendental numbers inside. So really, you can do that at your own time. I did that at my own time. It takes about, uh, honestly, 20 minutes to do that. All right, 20 minutes. Now, when you do that, you get this, expression over here, this hinders expression over here, hideous, downright hideous, because you got 4, k1, k2, a, the a is there, correct, transcendental number again, minus i, k1, a, open bracket, you got 4, k1, k2, cosine, and your uh, cosine, then minus 2, i, k1, k1 squared, plus k2 squared, sine, as expected, as expected, because the transcendental number e to the minus i, e to the i, k2, you can write down as trigonometry terms. And when you write them down as trigonometry terms, you get something like this, which is expected. But what is more important is that now, we want to substitute this inside that over there. So what I want to do now is that I want to calculate the magnitude of e, because ultimately what I want is the magnitude of e squared divided by the magnitude of a squared. Now I want to do this step by step, so in case if you run the golf lot of really simplifying this expression, you know what to do. So the magnitude of e squared, alright, is 
also taking the magnitude of this expression over here but since it's all terms which are multiplied by each other I can take the magnitude of each of the separate term and multiply them together as well if I take the magnitude of a squared I will just get the magnitude of a but now I'm just gonna bring it over to the other side okay because really this is just takes the form of this then later I can square the top and the bottom so this is equals to now what do I get at the top I will get just for k1 k2 right if I take the magnitude of that because I know that k1 k2 is positive so I can just leave it as it is next e raised to the minus i k1 a this is going to be 1 there's a few ways you can look at it the first way is that really this constant term detects the magnitude of that complex number when we express a complex number in the in the transcendental number e so since it's 1 the take the magnitude of that is just 1 the other way you can expand this as the cosine trigonometry terms cosine and sine but you ultimately get as always cosine squared plus sine squared which is equals to 1 so it's equals to 1 okay then next what I have is that I want to put this entire parentheses expression since so it's raised to the power of minus 1 at the bottom but I need to take the magnitude of that now how do we do that what we do is that we we'll take the square of the real part we we'll take the square of the imaginary part and we'll add them up even though it's plus or minus we will always add them up when we take the magnitude and then after that we'll take the square root of that entire expression remember it's always add regardless of whether this is plus or minus so open a big square root so what I'll get is the square of the real part 16 k1 squared k2 squared I'll get a cosine squared k2a and then I will plus as always a 4 k1 squared plus k2 squared square that and assign square k to a, uh, k to a and i'll take the square root of that whole thing all right uh don't be tempted right now to really try to balance this cosine and, and uh, sine terms and make them one because as you can see the coefficient in front is not the same though we can rearrange for sine squared terms exclusively but really it's always add all right so with this i will now substitute this expression inside the top over there after that calculation, we will just square the top and bottom, and this is ultimately what we get, all right? Again, a very hideous expression. But then, using this k1 and k2, which is given by, by these uh, wave numbers, given by these expressions over here, really expressing them in terms of the energy and the potential v naught, we know that this expression in the center is given by this over here, right, written ex exclusively in terms of the energy and the potential. So when we sub back that inside there, this is what our transmission coefficient has turned into. Okay, a very long expression and really this we can't tell anything just by looking at it. It's 1 plus an expression in terms of sine and we got the raised to the power of negative 1. But ultimately at this point maybe we can say that we have finally solved for the transmission coefficient. Now what we want to use with that result or how we want to analyze that result is really developing ideas of how we can adjust values of the energy, adjust values of the potential V0, the mass, and really the width of the barrier. But, you know, sometimes you want to write it exclusively in certain forms, so we, it's easy for us to really adjust these values. Now, you can write it in a lot of forms, but just a suggestion, okay? Let's just say that we leave the 1 as it is, okay? And then we would uh, plus 1 divided by 4. Now, what I want to do over here is that I want to divide top and bottom by V0 squared. So when I do that for the top, I get 1. When I do that for the bottom, the v naught squared can be distributed between this and this. This term and this term, this is a product of two terms. So I would have E divided by v naught, which right now we will label that as epsilon and epsilon minus 1, right? Because E minus v naught is um, epsilon and v naught minus v naught is 1. Uh, this epsilon is E divided by v naught. Just a way to express the ratios between the energy and the potential. Now, what I will do about the sine squared term is that I multiply by the sine squared term and then for our argument I would extract out a v naught inside this parentheses over here because if you can see if I extract a v naught I would also get this epsilon minus one term inside there this term is the same as this term over here so I would left with a square root of 2m extract a v naught so it becomes over here uh, h bar squared stays as it is I will square root that and I will also have a square root of epsilon minus uh, one uh, divided by a and that is our argument for the sine squared term take that all to the power of minus one now I want to re-express this in the center as something as lambda it be 2m multiplied by v naught divided by h bar squared square root of that and now this becomes lambda okay sorry I will include an a so this comes over here like that so our transmission coefficient after all those calculations using the continuing conditions is this this can be expressed as this because now what I can say is that I would want to see 
what is the ratio of particles that gets transmitted over the potential barrier when the energy is greater than the potential V0 depending on how I adjust values of energy and potential thereby adjusting values of epsilon and adjusting also the wave of the potential barrier thereby adjusting values of lambda okay and changing all these values really dictates the ratio of the transmission coefficient and that is our next step looking at the transmission coefficient right so right now a lot of solving showing the equations using continuity equations for now but at least now we can go into some analysis of the physical problem yeah